Welcome. My name is Andy London. I'm the lead for active testing in the materials research facility. And thank you very much for joining us for our online FIB event. I'm going to start off with a little bit of a introduction to the MRF and why we're here, uh, then cover a bit about some of the different equipment that we've got for looking in detail about Gallium versus Xenon for a FIB source. We'll look at a little bit of the technical specifications of what we can do with the plasma fib and some applications, uh, what it's good at, uh, before we cover some of the other uh, equipment upgrades, which are also being funded by the National Nuclear User Facility. Finally, we'll wrap everything up by looking how everything joins together and the overlap of the different equipment that we've got uh, before summarizing how you can come and join us in the MRF and access some of our equipment. The Materials Research Facility is a part of the UK Atomic Energy Authority, and we're the, the part of the authority which specialises in looking at radioactive material, specifically uh, targeting beta gamma emitting irradiated structural materials, but we also have a bit of a history as well handling beryllium, so that's not a problem for us. The MRF has some uh, medium and high shielded uh, facilities for handling relatively high quantities of radioactive material. We, if I draw your attention to the diagram at the bottom, if we have the most active sort of nuclear fuel cycle and nuclear license site areas, then these have uh, the highest uh, possible levels of radioactive material. And we have a cap uh, in our building defined by our safety cases, uh, just, over, just under four terabecquerels of cobalt 60 equivalent. If you compare that with what, what most universities are capable of handling, it's um, down at about 150 megabecquerels, so uh, a million times uh, bigger than what you would normally handle in the university. We have some shielded facilities to enable us to handle those high levels of radioactivity, as well as some unique research rooms, which are shielded uh, cells or containers that the scientific equipment is handled uh, or contained in. And that gives us the flexibility and the uh, be able to use the high tech equipment that you would normally find in a university, but with these higher levels of radioactive material. We focus uh, as part of UK AAA, we focus on fusion and fusion materials. A lot of all of our internal access is based around developing fusion materials. Uh, a lot at the moment on the sort of lower technology readiness level materials, but also uh, engineering assurance of some of the higher technology readiness level materials. We also support the fission industry and we've done lots of work on zirconium alloys, uh, various different reactor pressure vessel steels and nuclear graphite. And we've also done plenty of applications with uh, particle accelerators uh, and that's there's a lot of, that's because there's a lot of synergies there between um, the fusion and the particle accelerator community. So just to give you a Briefly, a very high level overview of what we have in the materials research facility. We have effectively four suites of equipment, those dedicated around sample preparation, those which we use for microstructural analysis, the thermophysical characterization and mechanical testing. And just to give a, a highlight of some of these, there's the hot cell line, which is shown here. This is allow, this allows us to prepare the highest level of uh, high uh, irradiated material. We have some glove boxes for doing low active, uh, low radioactivity samples, um, as well as some, a non-active sample preparation lab and some uh, ancillary equipment which is used for those uh, in those various different environments. So we can do cutting and grinding and polishing etc uh, in the hot cells or the glove boxes. For the microstructural analysis, we're going to hear a lot about dual beam fib. But we also have a dedicated scanning electron microscope shown here being operated inside a research room using uh, robotic sample loading. This is how we can get to those very high levels of uh, radioactive material and be able to use them safely. We have a confocal and Raman microscope, AFM, a, a rotating anode XRD, uh, which has been getting a lot of use, and recently installed the plasma fit, which you're going to hear a lot more about. Coming later this year and next year, we have some uh, uh, the tran, uh, transmission electron micros, microscope, which I'll uh, mention at the end of the presentation, and an annealing stage for in situ heating in our XRD. 
On the thermophysical characterization side of things, we have the physical properties measurement system, which can go all the way up to 14 Tesla and um, between two and a thousand Kelvin. We're looking at the thermal and mechanical and uh, sorry, the thermal, electrical and magnetic properties of materials, as well as thermal desorption spectroscopy, uh, laser flash, diatometry, um, simultaneous thermal analysis, gas spectrometry. And we're hoping to add some high vacuum DSC uh, to this suite as well. We also have a range of mechanical testing instruments, so nano and instrumented indentation, some small and medium scale load frames up to 15 kilonewtons, um, as well as the ultrasonic fatigue rig, which can do 20 kilohertz uh, fatigue on small scale samples, as well as impulse excitation uh, with a furnace to be able to measure um, the Young's modulus as a function of temperature. And we're We've recently received the small punch dies, and we're getting a furnace that allows us to do small punch testing. Um, and uh, there's the in situ mechanical tester, which is going to let us do uh, small scale mechanical tests. And I'll mention that again at the end. It's got good synergies with the plasma fin. So, moving on specifically to our new TestGAN Amber X plasma fin. Here it is being installed in our, in our research room. Give you a little bit of a, a peek into the chamber there showing the various different detectors and things and a view of the uh, the control uh, which has this nice integrated 3d model it's kind of like a little virtual reality model showing you where everything is which is very helpful when you're trying to puzzle out the complicated geometries that you have in a dual beam system so what does that actually mean well the main mainstay is that you have a scanning electron probe and a sample. This allows us to do high resolution imaging and allows us to see things that are very small, which is important for the FIB. Then we have this focused ion beam, which impacts on the sample. The sample's on a stage that can be tilted and rotated and translated, etc., as necessary. The FIB's used for machining, uh, for cutting out or cross sectioning your material, as well as use in combination with a gas injector system, which injects a precursor gas that allows us to do deposition. That allows us to stick things together um, as well as cutting cutting them apart. And the micro manipulator here that comes in uh, again at, right at the, the center of this chamber allows us to pick up and move samples around, which is very important for this so called lift out process where we can literally lift out a small piece of material from the bulk. The scanning electrons produce X rays, which we can characterize with an EDS detector in order to look at the chemistry. We can look at the backscattered electrons. Um, we're using EBSD, electron backscatter, and this gives a, a indication of the crystallographic phase and orientation of the material in the sample. And that's very, uh, very useful for looking at the, uh, the microstructure and finding sites of interest. We can also look at electrons that are emitted through the sample to look at the stem signal. We can either look at scattered or bright fields. Uh, this electrons that have come through there. And this is very useful for the samples as they're nearing the, the end of their preparation time in the FIB to be able to determine if they've got the features of interest that we're looking at, um, as well as complementary analysis to other techniques. So this means that the dual beam FIB is a very powerful tool to be able to really target the region that we are interested in. We can do tomography and cross-sectioning. So uh, with repeated slices and then imaging, either in combination with some of those analytical tools or just with the scanning electron microscope that we can actually see into the material and you know, successively uh, cut into it to make different images, pack those images together to make a tomograph uh, and then analyze that data. We can do micro machining and make small specimens which could be used for uh, micro mechanical tests or use at a synchrotron. Um, as well as actual materials analysis itself. So as a, an analytical tool in its own right, being able to use these various analytical detectors, either in two dimensions or in cross section, uh, or to build up a, a 3D section. So just to give you a, a little taste of what, what you can do, even just with a, a gallium fib, this is some work that we've done on some neutron irradiated iridium pebbles. These are for use in a, a future fusion reactor as a, a breeding material to generate tritium. We can see the, the combination here of the uh, EBSD, which shows up the various different grains that have formed in this pebble as it's been, as it's been made. We can also see the, the holes that have formed in it. So this is the porosity that's been generated during neutron irradiation. We can look in detail here at the chemical segregation using the EDS. So this is the aluminium. 
a signal, which uh, is probably not very clear for you, but there are actually sort of small veins which are formed in this. It has uh, segregated on, on, a, on a reasonably uh, large scale in this material after it's been irradiated. Um, and we can look at, at the, the large scale and small scale distribution of these pores which are formed. Uh, and we can do, um, hopefully, there we go. We can do uh, this slice and view, uh, successively cutting away the material to cross section uh, to look at the distribution of the pores in, in three dimensions. And this is just the, the, raw, the raw data as it was be as it's generated from the FIB, cross sectioning through a uh, reasonably small amount of material, a few cubic microns here, um, but clearly showing this distribution of very fine pores that have formed in this beryllium after it's been neutron irradiated. So we can take out small pieces of this material. Uh, here you can see a couple of the, the lift out sites where material has been removed and a small chunk of this, uh, of this beryllium has been stuck onto a, a three millimeter grid for handling. Um, and this is now um, very small, only about 15 micrometers across, thinned down so that it can become electron transparent and then characterized with transmission electron microscopy. And here we can see an even smaller distribution of pores uh, which are less than uh, 50 nanometers across, and these have formed in the material as a, as a result again, of the, the neutron irradiation and the gas production that's occurred during that uh, process. We can also uh, sharpen a fine needle of this material, which, we can, which is necessary for atom probe tomography, and this allows us to map the different chemical elements uh, in three dimensions, and this has been done uh, again in collaboration with the University of Oxford. And I'll mention the, the interaction uh, with them uh, towards the end when we talk about the upgrades to our existing gallium fib. So what makes gallium fib versus plasma fib so different? Well, in a gallium fib, we have a liquid metal ion source. There's a typically a fine hairpin, which is heated and has a coating of gallium on it. Gallium has a relatively low melting point. Um, and so with a, a moderate amount of heating, the liquid metal can, can sort of wick this structure and come down to the end where with the uh, application of a voltage, then ions can be extracted from what, what is nominally a, a very small source, very, uh, basically a, a point source, where there's a, then a lot of divergence um, of, these, of these ions that can then be focused by the different ion optics. So this is a, a very small emission surface. Um, it has a, a limited probe current that can be formed and the uh, effectively the, the limitations of the ion optics make it difficult to be able to get very uh, high current and useful probes with the, the gallium source but on the other end you can actually form very small uh, very high current density probes which are useful for doing very fine uh, work in the gallium fib and, um, and that's been the mainstay of uh, dual beam uh, or even single beam fibbing um, for the last sort of 30 years but with the evolution of the fib into the plasma fib replacing that liquid metal ion source with a plasma source, so a high frequency uh, breakdown of a xenon, a rarefied xenon gas to produce a xenon plasma. Once this escapes through a narrow aperture from the, from the ion source, it can be accelerated. Um, and that's what produces your, your ion source in this case. And as you can see at the bottom, the angle of the ions coming out of the source here is quite different. So in the gallium fib, you've got quite a steep angle and then the plasma fib a very shallow angle. Obviously because we've got effectively as, as, as many ions here as you want in the plasma uh, side you can have very high probe currents uh, but you do need a large demagnification of this source in order to form a, a useful uh, probe for then doing your machining and milling. So if we look at this in terms of the uh, probe size plotted here on the left versus the beam current that you can achieve with the gallium fib there's this fairly steep transition that cuts in around uh, 10 nanometers. It depends exactly on what your uh, source is and how your ion optics are configured. But that means above about 10, um, uh, 10 nanoamps that you, it's very difficult to get a uh, small enough probe that you can use for doing uh, milling of, of large areas. If you look instead at the xenon plasma, this has uh, much shallower scaling and that's because of the much uh, shallower uh, divergence coming out of the, the ion source. And this means that you can get up at these uh, very high currents, you, you get effectively much smaller probe sizes than you would otherwise get with the gallium source. You're also just getting uh, a higher beam current in general. And this uh, plot is from a number of years ago and 
with our plasma fib, we're actually exceeding uh, three microamps of, uh, sorry, three, yeah, three microamps, so uh, 3,000 nanoamps of current uh, in the probe once it's hitting the sample. So you know, uh, that's that, that combined um, with the additional sputtering that xenon uh, gives because it's heavier compared to gallium means you can remove an awful lot of material. And in this example, there's a, a cross section in a battery containing the uh, battery, lithium battery material, which is about a millimeter wide. And this was formed in only three and a half hours worth of milling time. And that's the sort of typical time that you would be uh, making a lift out on the gallium fib and you'd only be removing, you know, I don't know, a little, little window that would only be about 10 microns across. Um, and so this is a, consideration, a considerable acceleration in the amount of material that you can remove but also notably that we have a fairly fine probe that we can form with the low currents. Uh, it gets a little bit fiddly when you get down to these small probes, but it is possible to form these uh, very small structures like uh, those that are needed for atom probe tomography. Here showing a sample, which is a tip diameter of about um, 40 nanometers, which is what you need to be able to do atom probe tomography. Uh, so we're looking to be able to uh, be able to use the, the machine to be as flexible as possible. And be able to use both of these but we understand that it might be necessary to transfer samples from one to the other um, in order to make best use of the equipment. There's a, another advantage of going from uh, gallium based ions to uh, xenon. Xenon is a, is a gas and it's a, a noble gas so it's fairly chemically inert in the material. What's happened here is that uh, these researchers have formed a, uh, they've machined a small sample, uh, basically like a little tensile specimen, uh, which is here only about two microns long in the gauge, two or three microns. Um, and they're going to test this in situ in an electron microscope um, with these grippers, which are shown schematically over the top. And this is in a, uh, in a high entropy alloy. So this is a sort of fusion, fission relevant material. And what they found was with the sample that they made using a xenon uh, fib, they uh, had a nice kind of, uh, you know, the initial elastic response and then the ductile response of the material after yield. Whereas the gallium fib, they didn't get any of that ductile material uh, behavior afterwards. So what they saw was a lot of embrittlement. And this has been seen in some uh, other materials as well. We know that gallium is not chemically inert in the, in the material. It can segregate. Uh, and it can uh, cause problems such as this embrittlement shown here. So xenon is uh, very beneficial in this uh, regard in order to prevent modifications of the material that you actually want to test. So just looking in detail at some of the, uh, the Amber X specifications, we have obviously the xenon plasma source with an accelerating voltage of three to 30 kilo electron volts with a range of currents from all the way down from one pico amp up to three microamps. It has a fib resolution um, in the best operating conditions down to 12 nanometers at 30 kV, which makes it uh, very useful even for the relatively fine work. There's a FEG SEM uh, to make it a dual beam, and this has landing energies down to 50 EV all the way up to 30 kV, with a range of currents from two pico amps to 400 nanoamps. So the lower currents very useful for the high resolution imaging and the high currents obviously uh, necessary for the uh, high speed analytical work that we want to do where you want as much current as possible for acquiring uh, cross sections. And, and here with a very good resolution of just less than a nanometer at 15 kV. We have a variable pressure system in the, uh, for use with the SEM for looking at non-conductive materials. We have the Omniprobe 400 uh, micro manipulator from Oxygen Instruments. Have the uh, test scan true cross sectioning uh, methodology using a silicon mask, which I'll mention in more detail in a couple of minutes. There's the um, Oxford Instrument Symmetry S2 and the Ultimax uh, 170 EDSD, uh, EDS systems. We have in chamber and in lens secondary and backscatter detectors, as well as a, a dedicated retractable, retracted, uh, retractable backscatter detector for the, the best. Um, backscatter response as shown in these example images on the right. Uh, that's all tied together by the essence tomography uh, advanced 3D package for reconstructing the data in three dimensions and it's got a, a rather flexible stage with a large range of uh, x, y and, and z travel as well as minus 60 to 90 degrees tilt. 
So the silicon cross sectioning, so this is a novel method from Tescan where they've placed, uh, they have these pre-cut silicon masks, which you can place over the top of where you want to cross section. These are placed using the micro manipulator in situ inside, inside the fib. And what this means is you even out the propagation of unevenness from the milling of the top surface to produce a clean and clear cross section. And the advanced um, or the, the enhanced current from the plasma fib mitigates the fact that you're having to mill this extra material at the top. So uh, in an example here shown of uh, cross-sectioning silicon carbide, this is a very uh, heterogeneous material. It's also very hard. It's quite difficult to fib consistently and get nice cross-sections. Here you can see without the masking, there's a lot of roughness on the surface, making this cross-section practically unusable. But with the silicon mask, we can get a very clear uh, and, and useful cross-section that could then be used for, uh, for analysis. So this is a very good solution for milling. Uh, carbon and graphite materials, as well as heterogeneous materials that we often want to use in practice. This can be used in combination with a rocking stage. So in side view, the fib is coming in here and cutting a cross section, and you're looking at this with the SEM, and it's this uh, window of material here that we're looking at in the SEM section. The stage then has an additional axis mounted on it that allows this section to rock backwards and forwards, as shown in the little animation. And this means that the fib is always hitting at a slightly different angle, but allowing you to still image the SEM um, without having to move the whole sample into a different orientation. And this helps to eliminate the curtaining artifacts that can occur from the um, single direction of the, of the FID milling and produce clean and clear cross sections. So just give a, a couple of examples of where the plasma FID can be used in different applications. This is a welded uh, low activation steel um, that, Okay, sorry. Um, and the, there's the different zones in the in the weld here, the heat affected zone and the fusion zone in the middle. Uh, when this material is welded, it can build up residual stress and that can affect the material's performance. And what was done here was a, uh, a milling around uh, a region of interest with the plasma fib. And as the material is successively removed, uh, that relieves the strain in that pillar, which is evolving. And by tracking the surface of that pillar, we can actually measure the, the stress which uh, was in the material before it was stress relieved by drilling this hole out from around it. And this was applied across the weld to give a, a spatial dimension to the, the stress and, and therefore investigate the uh, residual stress within the material uh, as an alternative to uh, the kind of X-ray based methods, which are usually applied on, on neutron based methods, which have to be used. We then also did uh, nano indentation to look at the mechanical property changes um, as well as indenting on these pillars themselves. So they're big enough that you can actually put an indent, a nano indent in the middle of them and investigate the stress-free properties and compare that with the, the behavior under compression and tension, depending on where you are in the material. So I hope this video works, but this is a, again, an example of a battery material uh, in cross-section um, where it's been, again, successively milled um, in order to reveal multiple slices going through the, the depth kind of into the into the screen here and then reconstructed. What I'd like to draw your attention to here is that the analysis volume is 200 microns by 100 microns, about 80 microns deep, um, but with a voxel size of only 100 nanometers. And this is enough to reveal the, the resolution of the, the cracks in this uh, in these oxide particles of the cathode. Um, you can see the undulations in the electrode material in the middle, uh, and we can resolve the, the dark carbon-based anode. Um, and I believe that this data was acquired using a combination of the silicon masking as well as the, the rocking stage to give the, um, the best and uh, clearest cross-sections. And again, this is just using the electron imaging. So this is without any, um, let's see if I can play that again. This is without using any of the analytical capability of the microscope. So multiple cross sections, uh, each cross section taking an image with the SEM and then stacking those together and reconstructing it. So we can do the same procedure, but have the material oriented um, in a direction which is uh, able to be able to do EDSD. 
and there's uh, a large uh, single cross section shown here of a cold drawn copper wire, uh, which highlights that the microstructure changes in the middle. And there's also a three dimensional uh, EBSD map. So this is each one of those successive uh, slices has then had a, a two dimensional map taken of it. Uh, and that's been uh, uh, analyzed to find the grain orientation and the phase. And then that's been reconstructed to give a a three-dimensional picture of the microstructure, which is tremendously useful to feeding into the analysis of the material and uh, its different material models. Uh, oh, sorry. We can also look at the um, this in combination with EBSD. Uh, so on the on the left, this is hopefully going to show the combination of EBSD and EDX, uh, and the EDX volume is shown here on the right. So you can you can already see the different uh, elements highlighted here in this high alloy steel. Um, but this can be combined with EBSD at the same time uh, and reconstructed together to get a uh, sort of multi-dimensional data set and reveal, um, for example, that these uh, particles, the different, these different particles are actually forming along different grains within the material. Um, seems like I'm not gonna get those videos to work, apologies. I have to take my word for it. Um, so then just moving on to our gallium fib, our old and venerable uh, Helios from Thermo Fisher. This is getting a little bit of uh, attention as well. We're fitting an, an, e, uh, an EBSD detector to this. So there's a, an EBSD map shown at the top. And this will allow site-specific preparation to pick out particular grain boundaries or specific grain orientations. Uh, it will allow uh, transmission Kikuchi diffraction during the milling for, uh, again, for the, that site-specific preparation. We're going to combine this with a cryo stage to be able to reduce the heat production during milling and prevent the phase transformations during the sample preparation. And this is uh, very important uh, in materials like zirconium and titanium. And for an example of that coming up next. Uh, we're also fitting a vacuum transfer system um, to give much reduced surface oxidation during the transfer. And we're currently uh, and the only piece of equipment really we know about is the, the atom probe in Oxford who are willing to take radioactive samples from our fib, um, but there's other atom probes like the, the one in Imperial, which can also take uh, the same vacuum transfer system, um, and we'd like to be able to transfer to, to other pieces of equipment, so, so do get in touch. That uses this um, KF40 flange. Um, on the instrument itself, it will have a, a dock from Leica to work with the Leica VCTM. Um, and then we've also got the, the Ferrovac shuttle that is adapted to fit with as well. So just on the cryo uh, milling, then here is an example on the left using gallium thin thinning at room temperature and all of these red uh, these red faces that are forming here are these delta hydrides, which you, which aren't part of the material but form as a, because of the, uh, the milling in the gallium fib. And if you do this at uh, cryogenic temperatures, then there's no hydride formation. And these are actually um, pre-existing second phase particles in the material. So this is uh, very important for these, these alloy systems uh, where you can have these phase transformations occurring uh, if you're not milling cold. Um, and the cryo stage is also very important for trapping in, uh, say, hydrogen. If you're looking at where hydrogen is going in your material, in steels, hydrogen is quite mobile. So if you can keep it cold, you can trap the hydrogen in place and prevent it from escaping before you analyze it. And uh, an example that we did on the gallium fib of site-specific liftouts before we had the benefit of EBSD, looking at uh, retained ferrite in this hipped uh, RPV steel, you can see that uh, there's this the grain which is highlighted uh, and then this is the protective layer that was put down before the fib lift out was made and then you can see the, the cross section you can see this grain which has remained before it was then taken for atom probe tomography and uh, transmission electron microscopy and this will benefit greatly from being able to use the EBSD to identify regions of interest and uh, pin down specific grain orientations or misorientations for further analysis. We can also do transmission Kikuchi diffraction. So this is effectively transmission um, EBSD, where you're looking at as the electrons come through this tip, uh, the pattern that they project on the detector allows us to index their positions. Uh, and that will give you data, which looks something a little bit like this on the right. This is a, a nano uh, crystalline uh, grain material, but um, you could use this to look or target a specific grain boundary and effectively just keep milling in the fib until you find the feature that you want and then stopping there. 
And this, these sort of samples can be then transferred into the, the atom probe um, to do atom probe tomography, or it could go into TEM to do uh, other advanced characterization. Uh, and so that's something we think will be particularly useful. So just a, a brief word about the vacuum transfer. So this will allow us to move from our galleon fib either via the uh, ferrovac suitcase or through the uh, Leica shuttle um, to either the uh, docking station, which can be used with liquid nitrogen for uh, transferring samples or to other uh, vacuum uh, capable equipment that has the docking station to prevent oxidation of the sample and um, maybe partly to protect, protect people from the, the radioactive material or anything that's outgassing from it. This is uh, the Ferromac suitcase on the nuclear atom probe in Oxford. And that's this part shown here, and it connects into the, the load lock of the atom probe. There's a bit of a schematic showing the, the individual atom probe puck, which has the samples which are manufactured in the fib. Those are transferred in the suitcase and then moved through into the load lock chamber here, where they sit onto a specific cryo puck in order to keep them cold. Uh, and then that this is all maintained, um, can be all maintained at low temperature as well as uh, under high vacuum. So just to kind of bring everything together, we've got these various different pieces of equipment. Um, the ones with the dotted outlines are the ones that are new as part of the National Nuclear Users Facility. Um, we have the existing SEM for high resolution imaging and be, uh, being able to do analytical work. We have the new FIB, the plasma FIB for doing high throughput work as well as the analytical capability. We have the existing gallium fib, which allows us to do this precision milling. We're adding the EVSD for doing site-specific lift outs. And we've got the cryo stage and uh, cryo transfer. So these all kind of link together and they're producing samples, say for our future transmission electron microscope. This is a JL Neo arm, a 200 kV uh, variable uh, microscope, which is going to be aberration probe corrected. And that also has uh, some analytical capability for doing atomic resolution STEM. And um, it's got a high angle, uh, solid, high, solid, high solid angle EB, uh, EDS detector for doing uh, chemical mapping in the TEM. These, uh, the dual beam fibs are also producing samples that can be transferred externally. So these are to other high resolution microscopes or to for atom probe tomography um, or to be uh, used at synchrotron facilities. Obviously, as they're much smaller, they're much less hazardous because they contain much less radioactive material. And next year, we have the in situ uh, micromechanical tester coming. And the PFIB is going to be very useful in manufacturing test specimens for these, either micro cantilevers, pillars. Um, or other test geometries, which we can then test uh, in situ in the SEM or the PFIB itself. That's coming next July. So just briefly to summarize, we have a range of radioactive testing equipment um, and there's access um, either um, as a commercial as a commercial rate through the National Nuclear Users Facility um, through the Henry Royce Institute uh, for Advanced Materials. And at the moment, we're also offering these fusion industry program vouchers to UK industry, um, which if you uh, please contact us if you'd like some more information. And we'd like to welcome you to our facility uh, at some point in the future. So thank you very much for your listening, uh, for your, yeah, your time today. Thank you for listening. We've got time for some Q&A and um, please do come along to our FIB uh, event day in December uh, and see the facility in person. If you like some more information, please use the email address at the bottom and have a look at the details on our website.